Okay, I think we can start right now. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar uh, organized by the Robert Schumann Center at the European University Institute. Uh, my name is Renaud Deus, and I'm the president of the EUI, and in that capacity, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all and to welcome our guest today, uh, Minister Pascal Donahoe, uh, chairman of the Eurogroup, um, uh, who will um, present uh, his views on uh, the role of the Eurogroup in general, but also in uh, um, navigating uh, European uh, fiscal policy in a very difficult context. Uh, and it's a great pleasure for us uh, to welcome this distinguished guest. Uh, uh, it's uh, an important uh, event in uh, an institution such as the EUI, which has been created by its member countries as a first, a genuinely transnational uh, academic institution, uh, but also uh, with a, a specific mandate, which is to uh, focus on a very broad range of issues, which are somehow of relevance uh, to uh, today's Europe. And of course, macroeconomic policy is needless to say, one of those. Uh, we do have, particularly at the Robert Schuman Center, a very strong tradition of research, fundamental research and applied research on uh, macroeconomic policy. Uh, but uh, that also entails, uh, um, let's say, a strong interest for a, a dialogue with the world of policymaking, a dialogue which has started very early in the life of the Institute, think that uh, it is here in Florence that uh, in uh, 1977, uh, Roy Jenkins launched uh, in a public address, uh, in presence, of course, at those days, <laughs> in those days we could uh, uh, meet uh, easily, more easily than today, but this is uh, where he launched the idea of a, a European Monetary Union. And uh, well, uh, 50 years uh, later, here we are discussing in the company of uh, the chairman of the Eurogroup, an institution which remains, if you allow me a bit, uh, mysterious to many people. Um, I'm, as a scholar, uh, remember, uh, one of the first books to be published about the Eurogroup has as a subtitle uh, the uh, description of the institution, which I'm sure uh, uh, the minister uh, will like. It describes it as a, a secretive circle of finance ministers uh, that shape European governance. Mm -hmm. Your very presence, Minister, uh, I take as an indication that maybe uh, the institution no longer intends to be as secretive as it used to be. Uh, and I very much welcome this. And I also very much uh, welcome the opportunity of this dialogue. Thank you for taking the time of sharing your views with us. Uh, good morning, everyone. May I add my welcome uh, to all of you and to Minister Pascal Donoghue to the uh, EUI today to our webinar. Uh, Minister, the, as the President said, the EUI has a European mandate and we want to engage with the world of practice. But in 2000 and, uh, 2016, we actually launched a new programme, uh, the School of Banking and Finance. And we did so because of the federalisation, centralisation of banking union, uh, and also with the encouragement of the now Italian Prime Minister, Mario Draghi, who said to us at a meeting in Frankfurt that there needed to be not just an institutionalized banking union, but a the development of a shared culture of supervision and engagement on these matters across Europe. And with that, uh, in a sense, we were launched. And so we uh, launched the School of Banking and Finance. And since then, it has uh, trained uh, thousands and thousands of participants from across Europe, including the Irish, uh, the Irish Central Bank. And as uh, underlying our commitment to this field, uh, last year, the EUI 
initiated an, and established a new chair in banking and finance. And I'm delighted to say that the first chairholder, Thorsten Beck, is joining us today as director of the School of Banking and Finance. So we have now consolidated this field and we are very committed to education, policy dialogue and, uh, and research on what is a vital topic for, for Europe, but also for our globalised world. Uh, Minister, as you know, it's a very personal pleasure for me to welcome you. Uh, we go back a long way in terms of dialogue on these matters. Uh, the Minister has a very distinguished political career. He was elected to Dáil Éireann in 2011, having served in the Irish Senate in the previous period. And since 2013, has a very distinguished ministerial career as Minister for European Affairs, Minister for Transport, Sport and Tourism. And since 2016, uh, the very tough portfolio of Finance Minister, including, uh, including public reform and public expenditure. Uh, Minister, we are very pleased that you are using your time as a president of the Eurogroup to engage with the world of the academy and engage with across Europe, because I think that public sphere is very important. And if I may echo what the president said about the Eurogroup, uh, Paul Craig, a very distinguished EU lawyer said of the Eurogroup, that it can lay good claim to being the EU body that is least understood. So it, I commend you for engaging and for it trying in, during your time as uh, president of the Eurogroup to engage very widely uh, on the Eurogroup, because I think it is a really important institution. And it's important that both the public, but also the academy, that we understand what you do. Minister, it's a great pleasure to have you and uh, you have the floor. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, Bridges, uh, Mr. President, thank you very much for your introductions, and the pleasure and the privilege is mine uh, to have the opportunity to address uh, the Schumann Centre uh, and to give a perspective on the work of Eurogroup and to deepen the understanding that the academic and student community have of our work, and I hope by doing that to broaden the understanding of a really important group and body within the European Union. And as both Bridges and the President said a moment ago, this event, this engagement with you all this morning is now part of a regular programme of engagement that uh, I am participating in after every Eurogroup meeting. And uh, this engagement takes the format of seminars like that with the leading research centres across Europe, of which the Schumann Centre is clearly one. And I began this programme last month, when after the Eurogroup meeting of that month, I did a similar event with the Hertie School in Berlin. So what I am going to do is respond back uh, to uh, some of the descriptions of the work of Eurogroup by telling you about the meeting that we had in March, the work that we did, the output from that meeting. Uh, but beyond dealing with matters of process, which I know are deeply important to the union, given the centrality of process and institutions to how we create political order and stability within the union, to also talk about the work that Eurogroup is doing to respond back to the needs of our fellow citizens at the time of this pandemic and at a time of such challenge. But as I do all of that, while I am going to speak maybe for 12 or 15 minutes, I'm not going to go on for too much longer than that because the value of these seminars, for me at least, is having, having the opportunity to hear your questions and observations and to respond back to them in an open way. As a courtesy to institutions who host me, I always try to take a little bit of time in advance of my now unfortunate, unfortunately virtual visits to read a book uh, relevant to the local or national history of the institution that is hosting me. So like an increasing number of other readers at the time of COVID, I decided I tried to read the Decameron. But I began that project 
with little understanding of how big the collection of tales was and how long it would take me to complete such a project. So instead, I had to seek expert advice on where to begin and where to end. So I think it's fair to say what I did do is I sampled the Decameron and had an opportunity to read some of the most important and enjoyable passages in it. And what this collection of tales reminded me of is how eerily familiar the challenge of a pandemic is to humanity. The introduction to the 10 days of 10 tales tells of a plague so severe that, and I quote, whenever those suffering from it mixed with people who were still unaffected, it would rush upon these with the speed of a fire racing through dry or oily substances that happened to come within its reach. So in that summer of 1348, mourning and funerals changed in a way all too familiar with us today in 2021, when Boccaccio writes that, it was rare for the bodies of the dead to be accompanied by more than 10 or 12 neighbors to the church. So it is a book with very obvious parallels to our present situation. And indeed at our March meeting, my Austrian colleague made the point that it can at times feel that we are fighting this pandemic with the same tools that have been used for hundreds of years against plagues. The tools of quarantine, of lockdown, and indeed of isolation. But these parallels also have profound limitations. Medicine and technology will help us to prevail in our battle against our modern pestilence. And politics here has been vital too. There has been a symmetry in this deadly contest. A union built on political interdependence, the European Union has confronted a disease that spreads through interdependence. And the core theme of my contention to you here this morning is that while the European Union and all of us have experienced so many expected and indeed unexpected severe challenges with this pandemic, that at the same time, our union and our efforts have and are rising to this great challenge. The European Union has evolved with great speed again and it is the vital political dimension in our shared efforts. And I believe that this is demonstrated in the work of Eurogroup to which I now turn. So in our April Eurogroup meeting, we began by meeting in inclusive format with all 27 member states. This format was chosen because our first agenda item was to discuss our ongoing work on a roadmap for the completion of banking union. We were mandated by leaders to present this roadmap at our approaching Euro Summit in June, and I briefed leaders on this work, along with President Christine Lagarde, in our March Eurozone Summit. This was, it's fair to say, a lengthy debate, and we do have a lot of work to do before we reach agreement. But this was an important additional step in that process, and I'm confident that we will be able to reach agreement by our June deadline. We agree that the work plan needs to be holistic, it needs to be balanced, and that it will focus on four equally important work streams. The framework for crisis management, the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, the regulatory treatment of sovereign exposures, and cross-border integration. Our banking system has proven its resilience in this phase of COVID. Banking union has already achieved so much. This is all the result of our common efforts in the last decade, yet still more needs to be done. And I can say that ministers repeated their commitment to participate in this process 
to make our banking union even more stable and even more resilient. In Eurogroup, I continued with a practice of mine that I debrief colleagues on my participation in their behalf in international meetings. Again, where we've heard uh, comparisons and debates regarding the scale of fiscal effort across the world. And we argued, and I'll return to this theme in a moment, that some of this debate is akin to comparing apples and oranges. And insolvency frameworks, which we also discussed, there was a very broad agreement on the need for urgency to tackle inefficiencies, to engage at a minimum on sharing and continuing to share best practice and our work on non-legislative matters to build a consensus on how we can go further. The euro as a digital currency was also the subject of a detailed presentation by the president of our central bank, Madame Lagarde, who updated us on progress, shared with us some insights from the public consultation and emphasized the need for careful deliberations given the potential of this project on Europe's strategic autonomy and on our economic and monetary sovereignty. President Lagarde made clear to us that the ECB Governing Council will decide at a point in the middle of this year on whether to launch a project to further explore the technical design, policy and infrastructure needs of a digital euro. But critically, a decision on the future of an e-euro will only be taken once there is clarity on its use and role. And, and particularly on important matters in relation to how we can protect security and privacy. The Eurogroup will be engaged throughout this process to provide a political steer and input in work. And I'll come back to this in a moment. Finally, relating to themes introduced by Bridget and your president, we heard the results of the Eurogroup's current transparency standards and a review of these standards. This was endorsed by ministers. I am committed to ensuring a continued high level of transparency and engagement with citizens, with businesses and with policy experts. It's really important to me and it's one of the reasons I'm here today and I wanna hear your questions. So to return back to the digital euro, the proposal for this project is still at a very early stage. The decision point in relation to significant progress will come later. But it is important we continue to think about what we want from such work. The Eurogroup confirmed its support for the continuation of the technical and preparatory work in line with the mandate we received from our heads of government. A properly designed digital euro has the potential to unlock major benefits for citizens, for businesses, for member states, and for the functioning of our union. The primary aim of a digital euro would be to ensure costless access to a simple, universally accepted, safe, and trusted means of payment in a context of a rising demand for digital money. At its core, a digital euro can be a way to enhance the efficiency of our payment infrastructure and contribute to the digitalization of our economies. However, this will be issued as a complement, not as a replacement to cash. The choice of whether to use a digital euro will be in the hands of citizens and savers, but it will not mean the end of our banknotes, of our coins and our bank accounts. At the same time, it does have many really important societal implications. These include not only issues that your community will be familiar with in relation to the design of a euro, but there's really important implications which we're all aware of in terms of financial stability and, for example, financial inclusion. The increase in digital payments also raises geopolitical and security questions in the context of fast paced innovation outside of Europe. Would we be comfortable about putting this kind of work into the hands of third country private digital giants or a foreign company 
with a less, or a foreign government, I should say, with very different views in relation to human rights. These are really important matters. And we must ensure that a digital euro responds to and is tailored for the needs and specificities of our European economies, businesses and citizens, carefully considering this and these political and social implications. But critically, the technical work in relation to all of this is going to take some time. But when this work is done, there are some really important decisions that will need to be taken, while at the same time respecting the independence and the mandate of all that are involved in this work. And I'd underscore that very point, because of course, in particular, the independence of our central bank is the cornerstone for much of the work that they do, is, which is so valuable. Turning now to our response to the pandemic, we've always been guided by the aim of protecting the health and lives of our citizens, which has, of course, necessitated really tough demands on our citizens. You, of course, will be so familiar with this within Italy. And in my own country, we've had one of the longest running lockdowns in Europe. But we're all fully focused on beating this pandemic. And while there have, of course, been delays, the pace of vaccination is now picking up fast. And I and we, I believe, should be confident about the outlook. Europeans have led the world in developing and exporting vaccines and funding vaccine procurement for the world's poorest countries. We should be proud of our industrial capacity. It has not only delivered more than a landmark 100 million doses to EU member states to date, but we are providing vaccines for the rest of the world. That capacity is rapidly increasing, and we expect to reach an annual production capacity of more than 3 billion doses by the end of this year. And at EU level, there's really clear prospects for substantial increases in delivery in the coming months, to enable us to reach the objective of having 70% of the EU population receiving a vaccination by the summer. And look at what is now happening. In the first quarter, 107 million doses have been delivered. By the end of June, we expect that 360 million doses will be delivered. Look at what's happening country by country. In France, it reached its target of 10 million vaccinations a week early, and it's set to double that within a month. Our colleagues in Germany injected a record 720,000 vaccines last Thursday, and next month expects to be giving 3.5 million vaccines a week. Here in Ireland, our busiest days of vaccination were last Thursday and Friday. And for smaller countries like my own, the EU's united approach to vaccine programme means that we are receiving vaccines at a scale that would otherwise have been impossible for us. As a result of these efforts, and I would contend of our successes in some areas, all forecasters now see growth accelerating throughout this year. We expect growth of around 4% this year, and a return to pre-pandemic levels next year in the euro area as a whole. And there are increasingly positive signs on this journey. Economic sentiment increased strongly in March across the euro area. Retail trade is up 3% in February. All of our PMI indicators rose sharply in March and the composite PMI indicator is pointing firmly towards expansion. And I believe this optimism could be further recognized when the Commission publishes its spring forecast in May. The publication will also start to forecast the economic impact of the recovery and resilience facility, a once in a generation opportunity. This was a deeply important symbolic moment for the union. It's clearly defined as a temporary measure as you all know, 
but the issuance of joint debt by our commission would have been unthinkable before the pandemic hit. And it highlights our deeper integration as a result of the crisis. The EU and its member states, member states have coordinated to put in place an extraordinary level of support. Let me give you an example of that. The SURE programme, a 100 billion euro programme contributing to the protection of almost 30 million jobs in Europe with 75.5 billion euro already dispersed to 17 member states, including Italy, including Ireland. And look at the response to the bonds that underpinned this programme. Look at the strong interest in them and how they were oversubscribed. So I would make the case to you that our economic policy response has been unprecedented in speed and scale and made possible by unprecedented unity and solidarity within member states. This unity is truly where our strength lies and Eurogroup played a role in this. In March, we issued a statement where we repeated our commitment to keep fiscal support in place through a shared statement from all Eurogroup members. We indicated, for example, the need for continued fiscal support in 2022 and this year, and the need for agility in our response. And this is creating the framework within which additional decisions are now happening. Just recently, our colleagues in Germany passed a 60 billion euro supplementary budget. Our colleagues in Spain recently announced 11 billion euro of additional support for their SMEs. And of course, Italy is now preparing a substantial budget revision. And all of this work is happening in finance departments all over the Euro area. None of these decisions have the profile of a single plan, but they are happening. In their summary, they will be significant and they are saving livelihoods and they will accelerate growth. Because this pandemic is a global challenges, challenge, comparisons are, of course, inevitable. One of the most frequent comparisons we face is against the US, but I'd make the case that the comparisons are often not like for like. Although the US has spent a huge amount to boost unemployment benefits and health coverage, which of course we welcome because of the comp contribution that will make to global growth. In the Euro area, our safety nets and our job protections were on the whole starter to stronger, starter, stronger to start with, excuse me. It is true that direct fiscal support has been higher in the US, although the difference is not as huge once you dig below the headline figures. Besides the direct fiscal support, the EU also has substantial liquidity support in place. For 2020, the Commission assessed that the EU fiscal support was around 10%, excuse me, was around 8% of GDP in the Euro area, and that one should add liquidity measures to that, which would add up to around 19% of GDP, according to the Commission, with the US effort being approximately 10% and 7.7% of GDP, respectfully, respectively. Indeed, the IMF in its regional economic outlook last week actually finds that the EU fiscal policy response has been appropriate, noting that while the spend is slightly lower, it has been more effective in preserving households' disposable income and firms' liquidity. When you have a good story to tell, like Boccaccio, there isn't always huge focus on the details of that story. However, we need to be aware of narrative and the impact it has and be confident in putting forward the perspective on our efforts. Our response is strong in the European Union and in the Euro area. It has been appropriate, it is changing, and I am confident that we will prevail 
in terms of protecting lives and livelihoods across member states. So in conclusion, I've talked about the Eurogroup's united approach to this crisis. And this is what we are striving to do in our discussions between ministers to develop a consensus, whether on a digital euro, the future of a banking union or our fiscal stance. Every voice has equal value. And I'm always reminded that we each face the same issues at home. So we should share our experiences and learn from each other. And I put a huge amount of my own time into engaging with all finance ministers regularly and intensely in preparation for our monthly meetings. So I look forward to engaging with your questions now. And I'd like to finish with a quote, not from Boccaccio, because sometimes the kind of unions he refers to aren't the kind of unions we're discussing here today, but from your great statesman and one of the founding fathers of the European Union, de Gasperi, when he said, only if united, we are strong. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Uh, I take from your speech the themes, a project for the future, the digital euro, and then a project for the present, for the recovery, uh, the uh, pandemic response, and the hope that we get to the end of this phase of it uh, this year. Uh, before we open the floor for questions, and can I ask our participants to type your questions in the question and answer? I know there are some there already, uh, and I will uh, keep a constant review of them. But I will, would like, firstly, to give the floor to two of my colleagues to respond to the minister's speech. Uh, it's great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Daniela Caramani, who joined the EUI in September, is an alumnus of the EUI and rejoined as professor in September last year to direct our very important uh, research program on European governance and politics. Uh, Daniela, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for reaching out to us and for your efforts to involve academia in the Eurogroup's uh, reflections. We too, in turn, very much value the opportunity to hear from uh, policymakers and from decision makers for our own research, especially in a field like the one on informal governance on which there is a growing literature. And you strike a note of optimism. Uh, I sympathize with the standpoint of making problems out uh, into opportunities. Um, or put differently, never wasting a crisis. And indeed, if opportunities matches uh, the enormity of this crisis, then we truly face a historical turning point in which both formal and informal institutions of the common currency will play a key role. And this is a role that these institutions are already uh, playing, as you reminded us. And this is particularly true for countries like Italy, uh, you mentioned this, third largest economy in the Eurozone, probably the largest factor also of uh, potential uh, destabilization. And this role is first through the ECB's various programs to make a debt level sustainable, uh, low interest rates, as well as the general escape clause from the Stability and Growth Pact, the temporary framework for state aid plus the safety nets you just uh, mentioned. And these are interventions uh, that deal with the immediate crisis. But second, and more directly to the prospective recovery, we have the new generation EU with its various components of RRF, grants and loans, and REACT, REACT among uh, others. And this is debt for the first time issued by the EU as a safe asset underpinning an economic uh, union And as you reminded us, perhaps truly a revolutionary, a centralizing uh, moment. And yet, with great opportunity come also great risk. Uh, it is here that I think focusing exclusively or too much on technical instruments may lead to underestimating uh, the politics, the political constraints and the political consequences. And this is probably, above all, a matter of timing. Time is short for finance ministers to present plans to the commission and time will be needed for hammering out details for negotiation with the commission for disbursing uh, the money and 
for maybe what we could call contingencies, such as interventions by the Bundesverfassungs uh, period. Also, the temptation will be strong to use the available funds first to alleviate the immediate suffering due to protected closures, and for more popular or more tangible policies than climate or digital transition or abstract structural reforms. And another point concerns what happens when the general escape clause will be deactivated. We can be quite certain that 2022 it will still apply, but what about 2023? Will the old rules concerning budget deficit, debt to grow ratio apply again? The term premature is used in several briefings. It is a term that is used also in many papers uh, available right now uh, on the right moment to deactivate it. And the risk is not necessarily a return to the old normal, the euro as a currency area needs fiscal discipline. The risk is that this may happen too soon, uh, that is before the effects of the recovery plan kick in in terms of fiscal revenue precisely in countries like uh, Italy. And finally, money needs to be spent and we know that how bad certain countries are uh, at that. Uh, member states have to do a lot of the heavy lifting um, when it comes to spending, but also because for all its might, the EU funds are still significantly less than the national fiscal capacity. And this is the core task now I would say certainly it is the main task of the new technocratic cabinet of Mario Draghi. Yet it will be the EU that is blamed, it is the EU that will bear responsibility and this will potentially decrease the inclusiveness of the recovery and fuel populism and nationalism. So there is a political problem of deflecting this criticism towards something that can be perceived as technocratic institu institutions. So it is managing this temporal shift, this bridging that the coordination role of uh, Eurogroup is key. And my impression is that this will not so much or not only be a technical issue, it will be deeply political. So it is managing the politics of this critical juncture, a moment when the situation can take different direction would be at, at least as important as, in, as managing the technicality. So I see a risk for norms or rules that are to a large extent still informal, designed for what uh, the literature has called governance in the meantime, they, have, they do not have the same legitimacy of uh, decisions taken formally. So I see a crucial role for Eurogroup, but does Eurogroup have enough legitimacy, enough strength, not technically, but politically to overcome divisions, uh, to make actors compromise, to frame this uh, narrative? I think we all agree that managing the euro and the, and the euro group are one of the most prominent examples of this informal governance, of stepping in to fill the governance gap in the EU's treaties. Not that informality is necessarily a disadvantage, precisely being, uh, not being formalized can give an organization flexibility and lead to creative, innovative solutions. But this is true maybe more for the immediate crisis uh, and less for a prospective uh, recovery. And I say this because in reality, thinking about the recovery means thinking strategically about the kind of economic model uh, for Europe. And I see um, a number of risks. I, uh, I, I will mention three very, very briefly. The first is strategically, I think there is a danger of rivalries in using resources from the recovery plan, for example, through the subsidies, investment in industries that create internal competition an unhealthy competition, if you want, divisions rather than strengthen EU positions as a whole in the global system. The interest of different parts of Europe may diverge when it comes to manage this uh, transition in the next one or two years. So we may see territorial cleavages resurface or even gain strength uh, in Europe, accompanied by decline of trust toward one another. And so it's a cohesion risk, if you want. And second, cooperation requires 
shared and accepted rules with the legitimacy given to them by broadly supported and conscious authorization to act. And this is a basic principle of representation. Uh, and this is not the case. I mean, this perception is not given if the initiative is uh, perceived as coming from non-mandated or non-delegated technocrats. So there is a risk of legitimacy. And third, uh, such coordination, um, if successful, would strengthen the international position of the EU. So guarantee a certain level of self-sufficiency. I think this is also a very important point for a future uh, economic model of Europe. So co coordina coordination in this sense could guarantee a certain level of self-sufficiency of protection for over-dependence also from uh, abroad. But if such an opportunity is missed, there is a risk, uh, an international risk in this, in this uh, So concluding, um, my brief remarks, the EU is a compound polity. And what we know about such polities is they require a combination of both formal guarantees uh, through procedures and informal practices. Um, so I, did, I think this is a very, I mean, it's a, it's a lesson that we learn also at the national states from um, countries that are culturally, religiously, ethnically, compound, diverse, uh, linguistically uh, as well. Um, these countries are successful if they manage to combine formal institutions with informal uh, practices. But in both cases, formal and informal practices, they need to be accepted and supported uh, and legitimized politically in an open and participatory uh, manner. And this should be shared territorially across Europe, but also socially, as well as obviously between elites and uh, citizens. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Daniela. And now I pass the floor to my colleague, Pierre Schlosser, Scientific Coordinator of the School of Banking and Finance. Pierre, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, well, it's a, it's a real pleasure to react to your interventions and offer additional perspective, actually live from Via Bucaccio, literally. To, to start off, let, let me say that the Eurogroup was a key element of my PhD dissertation, which I was uh, very happy and, and fortunate to write here at the European University, University Institute some years ago now. Uh, Minister, you touched upon various important and substantial points in your address, which have already sparked several questions I see. As you explained, the Eurogroup, and on this I also agree with Daniele, has delivered significant achievements uh, in the last decade, starting with the creation of the EFSF, the ESM, the negotiations of a banking union, and more recently, SURE, and the recovery plan in the more recent pandemic context. The speed at which the Eurogroup reacted to the, to the pandemic, specifically last year, was admirable, also when compared to the Euro crisis management. And so where the positive inroads made in the completion of the banking union together with the commission and where I wish you really the best of, of success in finishing the job. Beyond the positive contributions made by the Eurogroup, I'd like to say more on the legitimacy risk that the new centrality of the Eurogroup in terms of European economic policymaking may entail, literally picking up where Daniele left. Um, and this should be understood as part of a wider point I wish to make on the fact that on top of addressing European citizens' problems, the European Union as a whole needs to do a much better job at clarifying its own authority to European citizens if it wishes to remain legitimate. Let me throw in some, some data. On the 27th of March, the results of a poll based on a sample of 2000 Italian citizens was released. The purpose of the poll was to assess their knowledge of EU institutions. The outcome, 83% of respondents, 83, said they don't know the difference between the European Council and the EU Council. 70% of respondents said that they don't know what the European Council is. And if you think about it for a minute, it makes a lot of sense that they don't know. The press refers to Brussels and most of the time not to its actors. The legislative process is, is complex and, and let me add, not very funky. 
As a matter of fact, 80% of poll respondents did not know who proposes EU laws. And I think it is in this context that the Eurogroup's informality and in a way ambiguous action scope are problematic. For the record, the Eurogroup was created in 1997 as an informal form and was formally recognized by the Lisbon Treaties Protocol 14 only later on. The first article of this protocol the only two of them foresees that the ministers of the member states whose currency is the euro shall meet informally. Such meetings will take place when necessary to discuss questions related to the specific responsibilities they share with regard to the single currency and the quote ends. Today, the Eurogroup is no longer just a meeting. It's been converted to new purposes. In the last 25 years, the Eurogroup has layered a number of competences, becoming a key forum for fiscal and economic policy coordination, turning into an, an architect, really, of crucial mutualized instruments while supervising the work of the European Stability Mechanism. The problem is that, as of now, the Eurogroup still lacks this formal constitutional treaty mandate uh, and recognition as an EU institution to be fulfilling the key economic policy functions that it performs. And, we, we will all remember Magritte's surrealist canvas. This is not a pipe, uh, if, you, if you picture this. Well, to me, this is where the Eurogroup is today. From the outside, it has many features of an EU institution, but it actually still is not an EU institution. And the long-term implications of this ambiguity, I think, should be really carefully assessed. For too long, and as you correctly uh, mentioned, President, earlier, was the Eurogroup acting and working in secrecy, fueling all kinds of rumors and giving an impression, to, an impression of unaccountability. Now, the series of engagements and dialogues you have initiated with European universities and civil society I mean, it must be placed in this context. So it is an incredibly welcome initiative. I believe, however, that in addition to this transparency exercise, there should be in due course a formalization process of the Eurogroup that should clarify its executive authority and ensure a clearer repartition of roles between the ECOFIN, the Commission, and the Eurogroup. And I would hope that the Conference on the Future of Rio will constructively address this issue. Why is this long-term, of course, issue important? For two reasons, I think. First, because having a too high number of political actors blurs political responsibility. You don't know who decides. And second, because digital or not, we are sharing a common currency, which for now is still missing an executive sovereign. So on political responsibility first, a key prerequisite for political debate to be effective and fruitful is that the actors of the debate, and in particular those bearing political responsibility, are clearly identifiable to citizens. Yet European citizens, uh, as we saw are indeed today, very far away from European institution. And I think in a way it's a bit like in a movie with, with a movie with limited attention span, you can't digest too many actors. So that's why it is important that there is a protagonist, the primus inter pares, who can lead the show and can incarnate political responsibility to the public. On the second point, the euro, and I think regardless of the crisis response management of, of the euro group, I think that the fact that the central economic policy coordination actor of the euro area is not recognized as an institution as such by the EU treaty is suboptimal and risks undermining the authority of the euro. Being a stateless currency, and I hope that the existential threat of Syria is still in our minds here, the, the euro both in physical and digital form needs clear institutional roots to anchor its credibility. Draghi may have been a magician at the time when he saved the euro, but he also filled the gap left bare by political inaction. And there is therefore still an executive void, which is threatening to, in my view, the long-term stability of the Euro and the ECB's institutional loneliness, which uh, Tomas Opadovas Kiopa was warning us about years ago, still hasn't been addressed. Let me conclude, however, on a positive note to say that, uh, and here, there also I agree with Daniele, from a European integration perspective, the advent of the Eurogroup as a central economic policy actor is really fascinating. It sort of marks a shift from what we may call a diplomatic modus operandi, and here I refer more to the EU Council, to a much more political way of doing things, building direct and lasting bridges across Euro area treasuries. But as for everything that relates to the management of core state power capacities, such as security and finance, this is really a new field for the EU, which uh, in its DNA is still geared towards designing and enforcing rules. And I see there are many questions uh, coming up on the stability and growth pact. So it is obvious that the EU will therefore need much time to adapt to this new reality. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre. And Minister, I'm going to give you the floor to respond to some of this, but because some of the themes that have already been introduced by my colleagues are also in the question in the chat box, let me add the questions, a number of the questions that are overlapped so that you can respond uh, more generally. So firstly, from Michelle Chang, what are the Eurogroup expectations for deactivating the general escape clause? Would a return to the status quo ante occur before reforms? Uh, Magnus Schuller asks, well, are the rules of the uh, Growth and Stability Pact, is it realistic that we return to pre-pandemic, uh, the pre-pandemic rules? And then there's another, can you give us a perspective on how the fiscal rules will evolve from here? So in other words, uh, questions about the escape clause and what's likely to happen beyond 2022. But as part of, obviously, uh, you can reflect on anything that's been said, but these are questions that relate very specifically to what we've heard. Great. Well, look, huge amount there. And I just want to thank Daniela and Pierre for their very, very learned and wise contributions that they've made. And I'll do my best to respond back to their different observations and also answer the questions that have been put to me. And um, um, in a preparatory discussion for uh, uh, this particular meeting, I was th for this seminar, I was emphasizing to all of you the huge value of, of Italy and the Italian economy as members of the Eurogroup and as key leaders within the European Union. And I, I bring this up now um, uh, because in many ways, the theme of the questions that were put to me is what is the balance between uh, the role of member states and the institutions of the European Union? And where does legitimacy uh, originate and how can it be maintained when we have so many different actors? So I'll open up by stating something that's very obvious about me. I'm a politician. And to rem there are many things that remind me of my being a politician. Many, many, many things. Um, but I derive my mandate directly from a uh, constituency in the very heart of Dublin called Dublin Central. And the legitimacy that many of you refer to um, is more than an academic quality for me. It's a vivid part of my craft and a vivid part of the um, craft that I dedicate myself to. So just to emphasize to all of you that when you talk about legitimacy, when you talk about the role of Eurogroup and the role of finance ministers in making really important decisions, I do see that as being a central issue. And the, the, the case for legitimacy is always ongoing. It always needs to be made. And where I would see the legitimacy debate in slightly different terms to some of our speakers so far is for me, much of the legitimacy is part of what I think members of your academic community refer to as output legitimacy, as opposed to a higher level focus on input legitimacy. I see the legitimacy of Eurogroup and of our union deriving from the outputs that we deliver that demonstrate the shared value of union. Because for me, the contemporary rationale and challenge of our union, both economically and politically, is the ongoing need to demonstrate that we can achieve more collectively than we can individually that Ireland achieves more to sharing its sovereignty with Italy through the union, and Italy achieves more on behalf of its citizens by sharing its sovereignty with Ireland through the union. And this is a, a process, it's not a project, it's ongoing. We have to continually make the case for us. And it's a process through which the passage of time is the defining feature of us. 
because the it is always the case that we have to continually make. So to therefore deal with some of the points that were put to me by your colleagues, uh, 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 Bridget, to start off with the three concluding points that Daniela made, uh, he talked about the cohesion risk that can be there in the next phase of our economic challenges. I mean, I, I would turn that point on its head and I would flip it around and make the case to your viewers this morning that it was actually in recognition of our cohesion challenges that the Recovery and Resilience Fund originates. That we as ministers, and then we and our heads of state realized that if we didn't act in a new way to support our citizens and to support countries within our union, and didn't deliver solidarity in, in a new way with a new temporary tool that the cohesion risk that Daniela referred to could become exceptionally severe. And I would argue that it was in risk, it was in recognition of that cohesion challenge that we moved. Daniela then introduced the point of legitimacy that uh, Pierre um, has, has, has further developed. And um, for me, the, the institution of the Eurogroup presidency, to maybe use somewhat grand terms about it, because we are a far smaller team uh, than many of the other institutions that you would refer to. For me, I derive and create capital and momentum through constant contact with the finance ministries across the Euro area. And my team develops that sense of momentum by continuous engagement with our colleagues to craft a shared vision of where we want to go to. And at times that shared vision, to be open with you, can be as specific as the location of a footnote. And other times that shared vision refers to grander topics regarding our budget outlook for 2022, while saying that the location of a footnote can have really big consequences for policy decisions that we might make in the coming years. But I think that does raise an interesting question here, because for me, institutions and the definition of political institutions are how, about how we enshrine habits through laws that form institutions. And maybe a challenge that we have with the Eurogroup is, is because it is a, a, a way of working that's based on contact, that perhaps that is the reason why many of you raised the very important questions about how it operates. And I recognize as those being important questions, I don't want to diminish them. And then Daniela Ray, you know, came on to the really important point there about coordination and the impact that our challenges could have on the international role of the Euro. And I simply want to agree with him on that point. I think it's a very, very important point that our efforts now to respond back to and to defeat this pandemic and its economic consequences um, I, I think are the necessary foundation and the key test as to whether we can strengthen our role further on the, Europe, on the global stage. Um, in terms of the questions that Pierre put to me, and you know, he really refined the questions and issues around legitimacy very, very, very elegantly. Some of the issues that he does refer to is, when I speak to my colleagues in national parliaments, the European dimension is brought up with them all of the time. What is the view of Eurogroup? What is the future of the Stability and Growth Pact? What is the future of the activation status of the General Escape Clause? But I think it's probably fair to say that I don't feature in those debates, okay? Um, and I, I, I'm not sure, Pierre, that that is a weakness of where we stand. Because if you look at the legitimacy challenge that you identified of the union, 
which I've acknowledged by saying we have to keep on making the case for. I mean, I have a ballot paper. I always carry in my wallet the ballot paper from the last election here in Ireland to remind me of the link I always have to make. And I'd make the case, surely we have the better ability to make that link if the key figure in our economic efforts is a national figure that's elected by a national parliament in which he or she makes the case for their national issues and then debates the, uh, their efforts in their parliament and in their government. And I would make the case actually that the balance is, yes, does have a degree of informality within us, reflects the nature of how we work, um, but it's a balance that reflects sensitivity regarding national economic decision-making. And I think if we can invite any of you into a Eurogroup meeting, particularly our more recent ones, they are very political discussions. They're really, really political. And for those political discussions to happen, we do rely on being able to spank, speak frankly to each other and openly and engage frankly with each other in between the meetings. And that informality, which you may see as be nebulous that needs further definition, I would contend to you is a important feature in how we can reach consensus. And to an earlier point from Daniela regarding you know, the challenges that a breakdown in cohesion could create, that kind of political effort is the way in which we can maintain consensus on really important matters. And then just to conclude with all of the really important questions that were put to me there about the future of the Stability and Growth Pact, from a process point of view, um, our good colleague and a figure very well known to all of you in Italy, um, uh, Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni, uh, will of course, from a process point of view, be indicating further thinking in relation to the formal status of the General Escape Clause in May, when the Commission published another update on that. And my expectation will be returning to the formal process in relation to that towards the end of this year in terms of its future. But they have outlined the direction of thinking from the Commission so far. And I should say, I think Paolo and Valdes have handled this sensitive matter in a very careful and very assured way, which has been really important for our efforts. But within a Eurogroup, and maybe this is to give you the best case for there being a political order around our efforts, from, a, from a, a fiscal rule point of view, actually many of those discussions will happen with an ECOFIN because the fiscal rules, with the exception of the two-pack and six-pack, are EU-wide as opposed to Euro-specific. And maybe that is an example of how the institutional definition could be a little sharper than you may be contending. Because from my point of view, the discussion on fiscal rules must recognize, for example, my friends in Sweden, in Denmark, uh, who are really important actors, as are our friends in you know, the Czech Republic and so many other countries, but for whom the fiscal rules are a really important matter. So the institutional architecture maybe is more implicit than explicit, but has the same outcome in saying that those discussions have to happen within ECOFIN. Uh, whereas within Eurogroup, where I will devote all my efforts to is budgetary policy and agreement on budgetary policy within the fiscal rules of the day. And um, as to how they may, may evolve, given how long I've spoken for Bridget, maybe I'll come back to that in the next set of questions. Thank uh, you. But I, I got so many questions there from all of your colleagues. <laughs> I was worried that if I didn't at least acknowledge them, they'd interrupt me and remind me that I didn't answer them as the <laughs> seminar went on. Uh we have, uh, I'm going to start grouping questions thematically because I think that's uh, easier for you. So there's a set of questions around what I would call the policy toolkit. One on, given that uh, SURE was oversubscribed and welcomed by the member states, should it be extended beyond uh, the 100 billion? Uh, 
Secondly, uh, the pandemic crisis, the ESM has a pandemic crisis support mechanism that could well benefit member states. So why have the member states not applied? Uh, and then thirdly, on toolkit or, or, or instruments, there's a question on the European Monetary Fund and the feasibility in terms of completing monetary union. So that's, uh, that's the toolkit questions. There is a very important question on the commitment of the Eurogroup to the climate transition and green investment and what is the best way or the best tools for uh, the Eurogroup to ensure that this is part of EU fiscal coordination. And then to prove that all politics is local, uh, there's a question from, I, I suspect from, from Ireland, uh, given the name, and that is, uh, there is a consensus that austerity is economically and morally wrong in terms of response to the pandemic. And uh, do you regret, both on behalf of your party and the Eurogroup, uh, in imposing austerity? Those are the three broad themes that I see in collecting the questions, given the time. Brilliant. Well, Bridget, thank you so much for all of those questions. I look forward to trying to answer each of them in turn. So if I look at where the SURE programme is at the moment, um, the case isn't being made at the moment for the expansion of that programme uh, because it is seen to have been uh, a really, really successful programme that I think we need to tell the story of more uh, because of the role that it has played in protecting so many jobs and, and livelihoods. But as with anything within the European Union, we will have to keep this under review. You know, we do hope we are in the phase now in which we are going to see the gradual reopening of our economies, the return of growth in the second half of the year, which in turn, I hope, will mean that a programme like Shore won't be needed in the way it was clearly needed in 2021 and in 2020. So I think for now, the scale of it has been correct and the scale of it has worked. Uh, but as always, uh, I know the Commission will monitor this as we move through the year. In relation to the ESM, um, the reason why the uh, pandemic crisis uh, uh, line has not been accessed by member states um, uh, uh, over the last number of months and year is because the other policies that we have put in place and have been put in place have worked. The importance of what the ESM did is that the credit facility was available. But because of Shore, because of the deactivation of the general, the activation of the general escape clause, uh, because of our efforts to maintain political consensus at a time of huge strain, and then critically because of the decisions by the ECB, the policy framework has been in place that meant that it hasn't been necessary up to this point for partners and colleagues to have to access the ESM facility. So uh, the reason for it um, is because of the impact of the other decisions that we have made. In relation to monetary union and the progress towards further monetary union, um, I see the, the, the next phase of this being, ab being about further steps in banking union. I think it's so very, very important. We did make a further step forward at the end of November when we strengthened the role of the ESM and brought forward the operation of the single resolution fund and changed the relationship between the ESM and the SRF in the, if we were in a severe crisis. But stepping back from all of that and dealing with the, you know, the really important points that Pierre and Daniela put to me, like th th that is about impulse. The importance of what we did there is strengthen Europe's ability to protect our citizens if, God forbid, we were facing further financial sector challenge. That is the big story of what happened there. And what we're now working very hard on, Bridget, is to see, can we reach agreement in relation to further stages of banking union across, in particular, 2022? And I can tell you, it's really difficult. 
These are really sensitive areas. But I also believe we need to redouble our efforts to make the next, to make another step. Uh, and I'm working uh, very, very hard with all of my partners on this at the moment to try to do that. In terms of climate, uh, this goes back actually to some of the themes that you've all raised with me regarding the institutional role of the Eurogroup and where we sit in the architecture of our union. And the context to the answer that I'll give you is our non-Euro friends within the European Union care as much about the challenge of climate change as our Euro member states. And I'm really, really sensitive to that really sensitive to that in the work that Eurogroup does. And this is why within ECOFIN, we now have really regular discussions on the climate change challenge. And it has been mainstreamed in the finance minister work in the last year in a way that is a remarkable change and where we would have been when I joined ECOFIN three years ago. There's a really big change. And if you look at the ECOFIN work program, climate matters are now on the agenda in a way that's very different to where we were even two years ago. And in terms of further steps in relation to this, for example, the work that Commissioner McGuinness is doing in now in relation to a, you know, the, a climate taxonomy so that we are more aware of how our investment choices are impacting carbon emissions. The very phrase taxonomy, again, speaks to questions of narrative and how we can explain this and respond to the kind of issues that Pierre has identified. But this is critical work. And I'm really pleased to see the profile of a rising. I'm really pleased to see, I haven't read the op-ed in the FT today yet, so I should be careful. I'm not gonna say whether I agree with it or not until I read this. But the fact that this kind of work is now subject to that kind of profile of itself is a good thing. Uh, but that will be progressed with an echo film. And then just to deal with uh, the question that was put to me about my, um, uh, my own role, um, uh, you know, the concept of austerity, um, in the future and in our past. So in our past, um, uh, uh, I was um, a member of government and a member of a party uh, that uh, came into government at a point in which the financial markets would not lend to Ireland. Uh, and um, for those who were critical of the decisions that I took and we took at that point, I continue to await their explanation about how else we would have been able to access the funding to close the gap between what we were collecting and what we were spending. And um, my experiences of the past always inform my choices of the future. And that's the challenge I set for myself. Um, and as we look to the next phase of where we are, of course, I'm deeply aware that if all parts of the Euro area were to go into a path of budgetary consolidation at the same time as a response back to a disease. Of course, I'm aware of what that would mean for the ability of our economies to grow and for the consent and support of this union that I believe is so valuable. But all finance ministers are aware of that. And that is why we are embarking on expansionary programs uh, with an institution in our central bank that's creating the policy framework for us to do it. Uh, and uh, I believe those efforts are playing a really valuable role at the moment in supporting our citizens at a time of need. And I believe, for example, the SURE programme, which is an instrument that perhaps doesn't have the profile that it yet deserves, is an excellent example of that. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm about to hand over to my colleague, Thorsten Beck, just to round it out. But I think it's important that I emphasise to my continental colleagues a feature of Irish political culture, and that is you do not get elected 
and you don't stay elected in Ireland unless you keep in very close touch with your constituents. Uh, and I have personally met the minister cycling his constituency in, in Dublin Central. It is a feature of our electoral system that the electorate has enormous choice as to where they position their first, second, third, fourth, fifth preferences, and all those preferences matter. And it's often seen as a weakness of our uh, governmental system that the localism is so strong. But in fact, in a world of populism and in a world of a divergence between the elected and, uh, and, and the electorate, the elite and the people. In fact, the Irish electoral system ensures that you really do keep very close touch with your constituents and hence the minister retaining the ballot paper as a as a constant uh, as a constant reminder uh, thank you minister for uh, for your engagement with us today my apologies to those whose questions i couldn't get to and the person who asked where they can do courses on banking law just contact the school of banking and finance and we uh, we'll keep in touch with you so torsten the floor is yours well, thank you very much. And uh, what you just mentioned, uh, Bridget, reminds me of the, the a former speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives who said all politics is local. And I think there's a lot of uh, good things to be said about this. Um, so uh, first of all, um, there's a lot to be said, and I can't pick up on everything that was discussed today. But first of all, Mr. Minister, um, thank you so much for um, uh, for your speech and for your uh, frank and open engagement uh, with the questions and uh, with the discussion. Um, yesterday had uh, Commissioner McGuinness giving the annual lecture uh, here at the, the Florence School of Banking and Finance, of course, also virtually, unfortunately, and uh, under the, 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 the theme of making finance work for citizens, um, which I think has a somewhat similar theme as, um, um, as some of my colleagues and you yourself has pointed out, it's really important to make Europe understood by the people it serves. Um, now, I have um, three remarks, um, and actually the first remarks, um, I kind of want to start with aphorism. Um, the first one, um, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, and uh, I had to look it up, it's uh, supposed to be by uh, a Spanish philosopher, George Santayana. Um, and of course, um, this also picks a little bit up on what uh, you yourself said, Mr. Minister, but also my colleague Daniele. Um, there is um, uh, There has been an enormous... Um, fiscal response by US, by EU government, sorry, by governments across the EU, but also the joint res, uh, response in the form of the uh, recovery uh, um, uh, tool. Um, countries have done whatever it takes to protect societies from the economic fallout from the uh, pandemic. At the same time, of course, we should learn, and you also emphasize this, uh, the lessons from the post-2008 uh, years. So it's not uh, just, uh, to do whatever it takes, but also however long it takes. So I think not to repeat the mistakes of the past, of the austerity measure that came into uh, place in 2011 going forward and ultimately um, had not just uh, bad economic, but also pot political uh, reper repercussions in terms of the rise of populism. I think that's important. I think that's also where the uh, Eurogroup has a very uh, a critical role to play. Now, the second one um, is kind of the opposite. So that's by the Greek philosopher Her Heraclitus. No man ever steps in the same river twice. For it's not the same river, and he's not the same man. Um, so the 2008-9 crisis, of course, started in the financial sector, and the financial sector was at the core. Back then, Europe was not prepared at all. Everything was had to be done ad hoc. Today, in the current crisis, the financial sector is not at the core. It's not the cause. But we are much better prepared. Um, we do have an incomplete framework, incomplete as you pointed out yourself, um, banking union to be completed, um, um, crisis management uh, and so on. Um, I guess the, the, the important question I wanna raise is that um, the financial sector hasn't been affected yet, but it might be. So the resilience that we currently see might be a false one, kind of hidden behind these uh, different measures in terms of loan provisioning, in terms of support by monetary regulatory policy. So they might still, and I don't want to predict anything, but we might still have the, uh, the fragility ahead of us. Um, and I think the good news is that, number one, we do have a certain framework in place. And number two, we have time to prepare for whatever might come. And I think it's important to use that time. Um, and I can think just of a couple of items on this line. Uh, widespread corporate insolvency might be an issue, um, which of course then feeds back into the banking sector. So what is the bank resolution framework as we have it currently, the BRRD 
fit for purpose in a case of a systemic crisis. Of course, I know that this is being discussed. And finally, the exit strategy. There has been support measures, correctly so, and most economists, by the way, were very, very positive about it uh, on the fiscal monetary regulatory level. But of course, we also have to exit these strategy. At what point are we going to exit them? And I think what most economists would point out to is that it has to be really done in a coordinated way across different authorities, but also national and uh, supranational level. Now, on the, the, my final remark, the third remark, and again, with thanks to you, and um, of course, also on behalf of the future institutions and think tanks that we will talk to, it is uh, very much like the fact that you reach out uh, to the academic world. And let me kind of, to a certain extent, return the favor with a call for academics to also get more involved, especially social scientists as myself and economists. Um, and I had the privilege over the past 12 months to be directly involved in the uh, policy making process at the European Systemic Risk Board, um, kind of emergency um, 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 policy making, I guess. And what I learned from that, and of course that's not news to you, is there are kind of three stages, especially when it comes to emergency measures. Number one, a short stage on the kind of academic technical level. Kind of what are the arguments? What does the evidence tell us? What does past experience tell us what we should do? A second stage you refer to is the political stage. What is actually feasible? And of course, you know these discussions from the Eurogroup at the ESRB is, uh, of course, um, the, the general board is made up of central bank governors. And then um, you also have to see what is actually, what can be actually uh, uh, done. And then the third level, you also refer to this, the footnotes, the editorial level, um, you refer to footnotes. I mean, I have the experience, is a situation urgent or very urgent? Should it be a comma or should it be a, a, a semicolon? Um, now, in this context, actually, just coming back on a political level, I kind of, uh, the, you, you draw from a point that I kind of always noticed. And I think that from the outside, I noticed in 2015, when in the Eurogroup, there were one after the other, obviously, two very different Greek finance ministers from the same political party, and I think with very similar views, but a very different style. But I, one, some people would argue the second one was much more successful than the first one because of its approach. So I think the personal human touch is always important. And sometimes we actually, technocrats, academics, somehow like to forget this, but I think um, that's something I think that I learned over the over years now watch, watching and being partly now involved in this whole European debate um, uh, and uh, mechanisms uh, that this is the personal level is a very important one. Um, so let me then just uh, end with this. Um, so I think we social scientists, and I want to exclude a little bit the, the legal scholars because they are kind of better in terms of getting involved in the nitty gritty here. But we social scientists, we like to get involved in the first stage, just a pure academic debate. But I think it's actually important for us to get involved also in the second and in the third stage in the political debate um, with the decision maker but also actually in the public discourse, because that's something, and I'm talking actually from, I'm, I'm seated, here in, uh, seated here in London, and of course, um, uh, you know what happened in, London, in, in the UK over the last five years, and I think they, uh, that's something that we social scientists kind of missed over the last five, six years, the, the direct involvement with the public discourse to kind of uh, try to understand concerns, which maybe for us don't make any sense, but we still have to engage with, because they are important, for example, for electoral representatives such as uh, uh, yourself, for elected uh, politicians. So I think um, maybe we uh, would like to end of this uh, and kind of a call for ourselves, for the social scientists to get out of the ivory tower and uh, get our hands dirty. Thank you again very much, Mr. Minister. Back to you, Bridget. Thank you, Thorsten and Minister Donahue. Thank you very much for the generosity with your time, which I know we have taken more of than we should. And I'm sure your diary manager is in the background saying, Minister. He's actually just behind, behind exactly. me at the moment. But if, if I could just say a word in conclusion, uh, I just want to thank you all for the invitation. It's a great privilege to be in a, in a meeting like this, in particular with Bridges. Uh, who has made an enormous contribution to public life here in Ireland. And I can think of few scholars that have responded to the call that Thorsten concluded with than Bridget uh, in the way she has done it. And I want to just acknowledge that. And also, um, you know, to conclude with two points that Thorsten also made, one of the things I always take away from uh, the uh, insight of Heraclitus it's, it's also about how you try to create a sense of stability when there's change all around you. And you recognize change, but also you recognize the value of a core of stability. Uh, and th th this is 
the great um, imperative of our union, that it is about how we can create order and stability to the benefit of those we serve in a world that is always changing. And then as all of your questions about legitimacy demonstrate us, there's then a need to continually make that case because we're always located in an environment of constant change. And my God, the last year has demonstrated that in a way none of us could have anticipated. And then to conclude with a note of thanks again for my being here with you. Like I think Thorsten made a really important point. I, I think there are a few countries that demonstrate the value of the humanities more than Italy. And of course, there are a few parts of Italy that demonstrate the value of this as much as where you are located, with the great Florentine legacy that you, that you gave to, you, to your country and to Europe and to all of us. However, there has never been such an imperative on the need to introduce the humanities and social science into our debate as there is now. Uh, um, I don't believe ec economics or politics is a science in the way physics is, uh, but I believe it's a social science of extraordinary value. And the need to make uh, your, um, your contribution accessible and relevant to those that I serve and to those who you want to advance the learning of in my God, we really do need it at the moment. So please do roll your sleeves up and join us politicians in our efforts uh, because it will be to our betterment and it will enrich your learning. So again, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I'd love the opportunity to repeat this again uh, later on in my mandate. And I hope at that point, I'll be able to join you all in person. Thank you, Minister. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you now. Have a great day.